Hello, this is Dr. Larry Wilson, and this is an introductory consultation that covers many topics um, that are important, um, and I put them together on a tape so that we don't have to go over them one by one. Also, so I don't forget to mention all these in important things. There's a lot of material on here, so don't hesitate to go back and listen again. I'd like to squeeze as much as I can on the tape. The first, uh, well, I'll go through the, the topics that we'll cover. One of them is hair mineral analysis, basic understanding of that. Um, a second thing is the general health program. The third is diet. Fourth is supplements, nutritional supplements. The fifth is lifestyle. Sixth has to do with your environment. Seventh has to do with detoxification. And then we'll talk briefly about other therapies. Okay, we'll begin with hair mineral analysis. Uh, this is a technique that is actually a mineral biopsy. Uh, one could use any tissue of the body. Uh, hair is used because you don't have to um, inflict pain. It's non-invasive and it's not painful to take the hair sample. Hair is also an excretory tissue of the body, that is the body gets rid of poisons in the hair or through the hair. Hair is also very stable. It, uh, it keeps well and it's easy to transport. And the analysis is very well established. It uses spectroscopy um, to find the mineral levels. This has been used for over 75 years. And modern computer controlled equipment is extremely accurate and reliable. <clears throat> uh, there are differences in the laboratories, and there have been some studies where the uh, authors claim that hair analysis is unreliable and inaccurate. Now, the reason for this, um, provided the study was designed correctly, is that some laboratories wash the hair, while other laboratories do not. Also, those that wash the hair wash it for different amounts of time, each laboratory, and with different chemicals. Because of this, when one starts washing the hair, the numbers begin to get erratic because hair is porous, and uh, although the laboratories say they only wash out what they call exogenous minerals, or minerals that are on the surface and not in the hair, in fact, the hair is 10 to, percent, 10 to 15 percent porous, and they end up washing out some of the minerals that are in the hair. A recent study in the Journal of the AMA claimed that hair analysis was unreliable for this reason. However, uh, if one studies the data from the study, which was only done on one person, by the way, um, the two laboratories that do not wash the hair came out with almost identical results. Six of the nine numbers were identical, which is excellent accuracy and excellent reliability. So, in fact, it has to do with procedure, and the only laboratories I recommend are those that do not wash the hair. This is very important in hair mineral testing because as I say, the numbers will vary. Um, now, it's important that the way the analysis is analyzed, um, we're not looking for total body load of a mineral. The way many holistic doctors use hair analysis and red blood cell analysis and other things is they're looking for, is a mineral high or low in your body? That's really not the way that um, Dr. Paul Eck, whose system... Um, we follow, uh, used hair analysis. Instead, the test is used to construct a metabolic blueprint or sort of picture of how the body is responding to stress. Because when the body is under stress, it starts dumping out certain minerals, it retains other ones. Some of them are lost into the hair, some are lost into other tissues, some become what's called bio-unavailable. And from this information, you can get a pretty good idea how the body is responding, and then from this, how to help the body respond better and correct the imbalances that are present. However, no single test uh, can detect the total body load because the amount of minerals can vary. They can be stored away in various body tissues and so forth. But anyone who says that because a, a number is low in the hair it means it's low in the body, it, it doesn't work that way. It's not that simple. It is a screening test. It's not considered a diagnostic test. But screening tests are very undervalued. Screening tests are often wonderful. They give a tremendous amount of information very rapidly and very inexpensively. And they allow us to design programs and diet and other things from them. 
there is quite a bit of documentation on hair analysis. I sometimes hear people say it's unproven and this kind of thing. But actually, there are certainly um, hundreds, I don't know about thousands, but there's hundreds of studies on, that involve hair analysis. Um, in August of 1979, the EPA reviewed 400 studies of hair analysis and uh, concluded that it was a reliable way to measure toxic metals. And that was in 1979, which is what, some 25 years ago almost. Um, uh, there are more, there's more information about hair analysis available, books, tapes, and other, um, and other materials. Um, many of these are available from analytical research laboratories in Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, their website is arltma.com. Okay, let's move on and talk about your health program. This program is not just designed to get rid of symptoms. Matter of fact, it's not focused on symptoms. And this is different from, certainly different from regular medical treatment, and it's also different from most holistic treatment and what we call symptomatic nutrition. Instead, it focuses on balancing your body chemistry. Now, the reason that this is important is because um, if you focus on symptoms, even with natural substances, often the symptom will go away. However, other imbalances can remain or be created that cause problems later. This is because every mineral and vitamin and food affects every other, and although some may get rid of one problem, they can create another. Another very important reason is that many people have conditions that are undiagnosed. You might call them latent or early stage, and um, they, are, they can't be dealt with symptomatically because we don't know that they're there. However, they are developing, and rather than wait for a full-blown disease to, to show up, by balancing body chemistry, these are often handled. You may not ever know it. You might have had cancer and never know it. But by balancing your body chemistry, the causes that were contributing to this are cleared out and the body begins to function better. So actually getting rid of latent conditions is a very important reason for balancing body chemistry. And there are, there are many others, but it's a more comprehensive, more preventive, um, and more holistic approach. However, there are certain um, interesting things that happen. For one thing, your symptom, the symptom which you think is most important, may not be the one that will disappear first because there may be other things going on in the body that are far more important. You may complain of low energy, but maybe there's a latent cancer, a latent heart attack, or a latent something else going on. And once the body is moved toward balance, the first thing it goes after, the first thing it tries to correct when the energy comes up are these more important conditions. So it's important not to focus too much on, on your symptoms, but rather just continue to uh, follow the balancing process. And we assess that balance with the hair mineral analysis and um, through questions and other, other things. Now, a primary goal of the program is to eliminate toxic substances from the body. Uh, we can measure toxic metals. There are also toxic chemicals. There are also biological toxins, which you might call bacteria, viruses, fungi, parasitic organisms, and things like that, which can also be considered toxins. They don't belong there. Um, but this is important because many, many conditions are caused by the presence of toxic substances in the body. Um, toxic metals, in particular, replace vital nutrients in enzyme-binding sites and cripple the enzymes, sort of like having a monkey wrench in the machinery. It just doesn't work right. I, uh, I often use the analogy, it's like a replacement part on a car that's not the factory original. It may work somewhat, but it doesn't really fit and it doesn't really work right. And you get enough of these and the whole system begins to break down. So eliminating these toxic substances and replenishing or um, uh, repleting, re yeah, I guess replenishing is better, the vital nutrients, the vital minerals is a big part of this 
process. This is a slow process, and I'll talk more about that. But it's like rebuilding a house, and if you think about it, you, you can't rebuild an entire house at once while you're living in it. And of course, we do have to live in the body because it would fall down. Usually, you have to shore up a part of the house and block it off and work on that part. And then when that's done, you'd move on to the next part. That's exactly how the body works. And so it is a matter of doing piecemeal work, little by little, restoring the body. A very important focus of your program is you're restoring your digestion. Because if your digestion isn't good, then that means that you're not utilizing your food, which means you're not getting the good out of the food, the nutrients. You may also be wasting vitamins and minerals and herbs and other things. Um, if, if a person has gas, bloating, um, and other digestive problems, it is an indicator that the food and the nutrients are not being absorbed and used properly. And this, of course, is quite common. Another very important feature of these programs is to restore the autonomic balance. Now that's because most people are what we call sympathetic dominant. That means that their sympathetic nervous system has been overused or is, or is in currently overused. Now in some people, the system's all burned out and it's not working at all. Um, or in others, it's still functioning a lot. But stress turns on your sympathetic nervous system. The sympathetic is called the fight or flight. And it is catabolic. That is, it causes tissue breakdown. So if there's going to be healing, that has to be shut off. And the body has to become more parasympathetic. Parasympathetic is the nurturing and nourishing nervous system. It energizes the liver and the kidneys and the digestive organs. It also energizes the organs of elimination. The sympathetic system energizes the brain and the muscles. That's for fighting and flighting and running and that sort of thing. Now, uh, changing that autonomic balance um, can be done many ways. Supplements can help. Diet can help. Um, attitudes and emotions make a huge difference if you're a worrier or you, if you feel like a victim all the time or if you're angry all the time. These will keep your sympathetic system turned on all the time. Um, there are other therapies that can help. Sauna therapy can help, massage therapy, meditation. Many things can help in this process of turning off the sympathetic nervous system so that the parasympathetic can begin to work better and so you can rebuild the sympathetic because it is an important one as well. But that's an important aspect. Now this process takes several years. The healing process takes several years. Anything less is not going to be very deep. It doesn't mean you can't get rid of a symptom in a few weeks to a few months. However, uh, true healing or deep healing, permanent healing, is not simply getting rid of symptoms. And it is best to plan on staying on a program, well, I say at least a year. That's actually very conservative. Um, I do have people that as soon as I start feeling better, I never hear from them again. But I recommend staying with the with a program, making it part of your lifestyle. That's the idea, and we're going to talk about lifestyle. Um, today, there's so much illness, and there's so much toxic chemicals and heavy metals and other you know, infections, bacteria and viruses floating around, that if you want to live a happy, healthy life, many, many people, not everybody, because some seem to be very resistant or strong, but many, many people uh, need to be on a healing program of some kind. Um, we can set up a program that suits your needs. I, I want to set up a program that you can live with. That is to say, it's not so many pills, it's not costly uh, to the extent that you can't do it or you can't stay on it. It's very important and um, I ask you to work with, with, uh, with me or practitioner to um, set something up that is livable because that's the way to get the results. Not to just say, well, all right, I'll do this for a month and then I'll have to move on to something else or I can't do it anymore. And that means setting up your whole life um, to work with the program. For example, um, lots of rest is very important. Well, if your life is booked up from morning till night, you're just running and running and appointments and so forth, um, it's not going to be easy to do that. Matter of fact, it won't be possible. So it requires making room in your life for healing. 
That has to be a priority. I tell people who are very sick, I say, healing is now your job. You know, think of that as your, as your main occupation. Your so-called job, you know, you may do that for money or as a vocation or as something else to do, but your job is healing. And it's got to be first priority, especially if you're very ill. Otherwise, it won't happen. You'll, you'll get carried away with other things and you'll forget your program and you just won't have the results. And this happens all the time. Um, so it's, it's important that your priorities be set straight. And if you want to do healing, then do it. Um, an important principle of living is that anything you commit yourself to, you will achieve. If you do not achieve it, my experience is, if you do not achieve it, it's because you really didn't, you changed your commitment. In other words, you, you decided not to make it a, a, a priority. There's nothing wrong with that. That's not a judgment. But people who tell me, well, I tried this, I tried to make money, and I tried to get well, and I tried to study this book, but I couldn't or whatever. Well, no, I don't really buy that. And I suggest that you look at that and think about that. Anything you commit yourself to, you will achieve. Um, and so healing is like that, and, um, and it's important to remember that. Okay. Um, it does take patience and persistence, and it takes a lot of compassion for yourself. Most of us have no idea how sick we are. And I don't mean to sound morbid, but um, from doing uh, the work on many, many, many people, the bodies are not in good shape. And what they call good health is, I'd say, average to mediocre. It is rare for me to find a person in good health. And that's the people, I'm talking about the ones who'd say they're in good health. So it takes patience, it takes persistence. You may come up against infections that you didn't know you had, um, illnesses and metals poisoning and all sorts of stuff. You just have to say, no problem, we'll just keep at this. And there is light at the end of the tunnel. I speak as one who was very, very ill. And um, it's taken a number of years, you know. But I feel really wonderful now. And I'm very, very grateful. You become really grateful for your health, by the way. So uh, you just stay with it. And, you, and follow-up is so important with this. In other words, um, you don't want to just get on a program and never talk to your health practitioner again. That's not the way to do it. Follow-up is important. Ask questions, have mineral retests, hair mineral retests, and consultations so that you stay on top of things um, at least every few months, I would suggest. Okay, let's move on to the next topic, and this will be diet. Uh, diet is a very important part of any healing program. Uh, when I hear of people who go to, they sometimes go to specialty centers, even for chronic fatigue syndrome, and I say to them, well, what did they say about your diet? And they say, well, they didn't really say very much. Then I know that they are missing a big part. Um, I won't go as far as to say you are what you eat, but today, in particular, so much of the food is denatured, processed, um, laced with uh, pesticide residues and toxic metals and um, so forth, that um, you know, following a good diet, which doesn't mean something that's uh, wild and absolutely strict so much that you feel like you're in a straitjacket. But following a good diet is extremely important. I knew, know a lot of people who are happy to take pills. They'll take 80 pills a day, but they don't want to do the diet. Well, you really can't substitute pills for food. Um, there are a couple of reasons for this. One is there are nutrients we have not discovered. We're always discovering new ones. You know, it may be found in broccoli or cabbage or something. Whatever it is, they've done experiments on rats where they feed them just pills, you know, vitamin pills, um, and no food, and they don't do too well. They eventually sicken. So that's one reason. Um, and then uh, the food tends to be more balanced in many ways, providing a wide range of things. And to duplicate this with, with um, supplements or other things, um, just doesn't work. So pills are supplements. That's why we call them nutritional supplements. They supplement an excellent diet. A good rule is that it's best to get to like the food that's good for you. 
if you're too fussy and you say, well, you know, I'm just not going to give up my, I don't know what, you know, my donuts or something, you're not going to get very far with healing. An excellent attitude, which I had to adopt uh, to get well, and I'm very glad I did. Sure, I struggled um, in the beginning, was that I just decided, you know, I'm going to eat what I need to eat. I'm not going to worry about um, whether I love the taste, whether it reminds me of my mother's cooking, um, whether it's um, some animal that, gee, maybe I shouldn't be eating this animal because that's killing and blah, blah, blah. I got past all that stuff. And what I find is if you want to get well, that's the way to do it. My attitude is if I have to stand on my head and eat rattlesnake meat and buffalo tails or something, fine. That's it. So it is best to get to like the food that's good for you and not to worry too much about it. Um, and actually, you know, natural foods actually taste very good. Many people are not used to them because they're used to the sugared and over-salted um, junk food or empty calories, which are, they add the sugar and the salt and the spices and other things, the MSG, because that food doesn't have much flavor. But as you eliminate those things, you will begin to detect more flavor, and as you go to organic foods in particular, there's a lot more flavor. Also, there are many foods that we're not used to eating, and as you begin to eat those, you'll discover many new flavors that are rather interesting. Um, I had never eaten things like root vegetables before, turnips and rutabagas and celery root and all sorts of things like this, and many, many vegetables that I was never raised on, um, daikon and you know, um, all kinds of exotic things. But they're there, and they are actually excellent foods. There's no, tr there's no reason you can't transition to a better diet. In other words, please don't be put off by a dietary regimen that's suggested and, and take the attitude, well, oh, my God, I don't know how to do this. I don't know where to begin. And besides, it's, you know, I, I don't even know what these things are, and they taste weird. That, it's okay to transition. Now, if you are very ill, you might want to transition quickly because you may not have a lot of time. But I suggest just moving in the right direction. That's, that's a good start. Move in the right direction. Go from poor quality to a little better quality to a little better quality. If you're used to living on donuts, well, maybe you can go from glazed donuts to plain donuts. Now, that's not much of a transition, but you know what? It is in the right direction, and you'd probably cut your sugar consumption down a lot. If you're used to coffee with you know, three or four tablespoons of sugar in it, well, then go to coffee with no sugar in it or less sugar as a start, and then maybe we can get rid of the coffee because coffee is a stimulant and, in general, is not helpful for health. Um, a good transition is to eliminate sugar in all its forms, and this can be quite a job if you're used to standard American diet because they put sugar in everything from cereal to soda pop to um, ketchup um, to, oh, all kinds of stuff that you can't even imagine that it would be, and you have to read the labels. Um, it's in soy sauce, for example, sometimes salt. They even put sugar in. Um, so eliminating sugar, which goes under different names, such as corn syrup, um, liquid sugar, corn sugar, beet sugar, um, corn uh, rice syrup, um, malt syrup, barley malt. Many of these things are very, very sweet and very high in sugar. Honey is rather sweet. I think maple syrup is a little bit better if it's real maple syrup, but of course the maple syrup that you buy in the supermarket is generally just corn syrup. That's all it is. It's just sugar. The less, the better. Uh, fruit juices are very high in sugar. Um, you, now, you may transition to fruit juices from, say, soda pop, but actually I don't recommend fruit juices, even natural fruit juice. They often are moldy, and they're too sweet. Um, another excellent food to transition away from is wheat and spelt. Uh, wheat is found in, again, thousands of foods hidden away. Um, wheat, of, of course, is found in flour. It doesn't have to say wheat flour. It can just say flour. Uh, sometimes... It, it, it is hidden in things like rye bread. You'd think, oh, that must be rye. But if you read the label, most of it's wheat, or a lot of it's wheat also is in there. Crackers, breads, pastries, cookies, cakes, pies, uh, pie crust, you know, um, pastas. 
And you see there are substitutes for these things available today, a lot of substitutes. There's pasta made out of rice, there's pasta made out of corn, there's pasta from quinoa. There's the, uh, the little noodles made out of bean threads that are used in the Chinese and the Thai restaurants. So there really are substitutes, and it just takes a little time to find the place, usually in a health food market, where they have these things. And then you have to experiment with them a little bit and get used to eating them. But they're there. They have all the Italian noodles and other things. Um, spelt is, is better, but I, I, don't, I don't suggest spelt either. Most people are allergic to the wheat family. Wheat is not the wonderful food it used to be, and that includes organically grown wheat. Uh, another food to transition away from is cow's milk dairy. Um, that includes milk, cheese, and yogurt. Butter is usually okay because butter is almost a pure fat. If you want the pure fat, you could have what's called ghee, which is clarified butter, but even butter is usually fine, um, uh, even cream. But milk, cheese, and yogurt often cause reactions in adults. And again, I don't think they're that good. You can substitute goat milk products. Most people handle the goat milk a lot better. But the wheat and the cow's milk dairy are irritating to the intestines. They're inflammatory. They're pro-inflammatory. They lead often to what's called leaky gut syndrome, which in turn causes a myriad of other diseases because particles that should not get through your intestines into your body get in, and you end up with a toxic condition, which the liver has to deal with, on top of all our other problems, and this effectively either stops or slows your healing progress. So there are substitutes for the sugar. Well, sugar, um, weaning yourself off of the sweet taste is very excellent. I don't recommend the artificial sweeteners like NutraSweet and Saccharin and Splenda and all those. Um, I think the best thing is to wean off the sweet taste, just use less and less of the sweeteners, um, but wheat and cow's milk dairy are common allergic foods, and most people are better off without them. Now, transitioning away from those is a huge step. In addition, um, you'll be, uh, a diet will be suggested for your metabolic type, for oxidation type, and that has a little more uh, specific uh, food types. But those, those three things, another thing to get away from, by the way, is vegetable oils. Um, especially what's called hydrogenated oils found in margarine, commercial peanut butter, shortening, and things like that. But actually, all the vegetable oils, except for olive oil and coconut oil, are highly refined and are best eliminated. Cook with olive oil or butter or coconut oil is excellent, but try to get away from the corn oil and the safflower and the sunflower and all those things. Okay. Um, eating habits are important, but I think we'll talk about them in lifestyle. Um, actually, I'll mention them because they're so important that I'll mention them twice. It is very important to eat quiet, relaxed, regular meals. That means do not eat in your car. Do not eat standing up in front of the refrigerator. Do not eat in 10 minutes by just shoving the food in your mouth and then jumping up and going back to work or something. Don't eat at your desk with the telephones ringing and the people coming in and out. Those habits keep your sympathetic nervous system on when, in fact, eating is a parasympathetic activity and the sympathetic system needs to be off so that you can absorb and digest your food. If you eat with poor eating habits, you will not absorb your food. You will not get the good out of it. You've sort of wasted it. Animals are much better this way. They will usually stop eating if you even walk in the room, like if you have a dog or a cat. If you disturb them, they stop eating. And they won't start again until they're they're relaxed. They know that, that it's important to be very relaxed at meals. Mealtime is not the time to scold your children or to have an argument with your husband. It's not the time for that. It's not the time to listen to the horrible news of the day or anything like that. If you're alone, particularly, and you want to read at a meal, I think that's fine. But And actually, that can be relaxing, but don't make it something negative and heavy and you know, some political stuff. Try to make it something light and, and cheerful. Uh, eat slowly, chew thoroughly, eat consciously. Now, to make your eating simple, it's important to have 
basic cookware. Um, and it doesn't have to be fancy. The best type is glass, like corningware, um, steel, stainless steel. It can be ceramic, uh, glazed ceramic. And uh, Teflon is okay as long as it's not chipped, Teflon or Silverstone coated. Um, I do not recommend aluminum cookware, nor iron cookware, nor uh, copper cookware. Uh, simple things to have around are a crock pot, a steamer. Many people like a toaster oven rather than having to use a big oven. Um, and a nut and seed grinder is very nice. Uh, electric stoves are actually better than gas because the gas gives off fumes, and if someone is chemically sensitive, uh, they may notice that. I do not recommend microwave ovens. You can do everything with a regular uh, toaster oven, um, and in almost as much time, it's not a big deal. Um, the way that I do a lot of cooking is simply to um, have a saucepan with some a little bit of water in it. I bring it to a boil, turn it down, chop in some vegetables. I buy a couple pounds at a time of ground beef, ground turkey, and make it into little patties, um, and freeze it. I also buy a good quality chicken thighs usually. They're more nutritious actually than the chicken breasts. And I put them into meal-sized portions and freeze those. And then I pull out one of those frozen uh, meats plus my vegetables, and I have a meal. And it's a very nice meal. And you don't have to watch it cook, and that's important because we're trying to make it easy. Everything cooks in about half an hour. Um, simple things like this are very good. Crock pots are wonderful because you just throw things in. You don't have to cut vegetables up. That keeps the juices inside, and they taste better. And then you set it for eight hours and come back, and you have your meal. Um, if cooking becomes a chore, then you know you, you won't do it. But if it can be fun and simple and seen as loving yourself, that's the key. Um, when you buy food, fresh is best. Frozen is okay. And there is now more and more organic frozen. Someone just told me that even Costco is selling organic frozen vegetables. Um, store vegetables in the bottom of a refrigerator. They will keep a long time. Organic is definitely better if you can find them. Sometimes they're not that good, and sometimes the commercially grown stuff is, is fine. Meats should be natural without hormones and antibiotics added. And you will notice a difference in the taste of the natural products. Um, a good idea is to go through your kitchen and clean it out. Get rid of the foods that you're no longer going to eat, all the white flour, the white sugar, the refined and processed um, stuff that is lying around, and just get rid of it. It'll make lots of room and nice and clean. Uh, that's, a, that's often very helpful. Uh, fish is okay, but most fish is contaminated with um, mercury, especially your shellfish and any fish caught near the coast. Um, small fish are better, like sardines, uh, even in a can. Um, if you can get wild salmon, it's great. Um, most fish is farmed today and may not be that healthy, but small fish is fine. And I don't encourage too much fish eating, even though it's, it, it was a good food. Um, uh, but, but it's no longer so. So some fish is fine, but I wouldn't focus on it. Um, some people are fast metabolizers and some are slow. The fast need more fat in their diet. And... They need fat with every meal. Slow metabolizers need more protein. They need it with every meal, definitely. And this just becomes a, a good habit, a simple habit of asking, what's my protein? It's not a bad idea to eat some protein with each meal. Nuts, by the way, are very good, especially toasted almonds and almond butter. Um, I think this is helpful for parasites, which everybody has. And it's a good food. And then you can buy raw walnuts, hazelnuts, pecans, cashews and these can be stored in the freezer that's the best place that way you can have them there you can rotate them and yet you don't have to keep buying them um, among the carbohydrate foods roots are excellent root vegetables many people including myself don't even know what these are or never ate them but I just slice them and put them in 
and with every lunch or supper and supper I have one root vegetable and one other kind of vegetable. Cooked is often better than raw because if your digestion is weak, you have trouble getting the good out of raw foods. You have to heat them up and you have to digest them well. Cooked food is more concentrated and you'll get more nutrients out of it. So I encourage you to have a root vegetable, which is like celery root, uh, garlic, um, ginger root, burdock root, um, oh, turnips, parsnips, rutabagas, um, carrots or onions. Beet is a little bit toxic and I'm not as crazy about it. And then have another kind of vegetable as well, twice a day, twice a day, two or more vegetables. Um, blue corn is actually an excellent food. Even blue corn chips, which is the easiest way to eat those, the organic blue corn chips. Rice is an excellent grain. Uh, quinoa is an interesting one if you've never tried it. Cooks easily and quickly. A good rule of thumb with carbohydrates is to have only one kind per meal. This is because it's easy to overeat on carbohydrates. Um, simple carbohydrates I suggest minimizing. That's anything that's sweet, fruit, fruit juices, um, sweets and sugars of all kinds. You can have a little bit of fruit for occasional dessert, like a few berries are very good. The berries are excellent foods. Um, but don't have a lot of simple carbohydrates. I recommend you drink spring or distilled water. I don't recommend a lot of the drinking water out there. The water from the water machines, from the water stores is better than the little machines because the filters are more likely to be clean. You don't know when you're using reverse osmosis water how clean the filters are. And when you go to restaurants, this is always a challenge, but actually oriental restaurants are probably the best. They make the food fresh generally. They use lots of vegetables and you can get some meat. They don't use a lot of wheat and bread. Uh, they don't use a lot of cheese and dairy products. And they don't usually use a lot of sugar. They may use MSG, and you can ask about that. So uh, eating out is a challenge, but if you know what you want, you'll get so that you can do just fine. Um, the problem is quality often. Another area here is supplements. The supplements that are recommended for you are to be taken with meals unless otherwise indicated. Usually the, the only one that comes to mind that you take Early in the morning before breakfast, 15 minutes before breakfast with water, is acidophilus type of products, probiotics. They often do well that way. Most can be taken before, after, or during meals. Sometimes you'll get, you won't feel as well, for example, with a digestive aid if you just take it after the meal. You might do better taking it before or during. A usual supplement program consists of a digestive aid, a metabolic pack, which is a multivitamin for your metabolic type, Glandular support, the glandular products are very, very helpful. And don't worry about mad cow disease, please. You haven't heard about that for, well, a couple of years, and there's a good reason for it. There's no problem there. Supplements for detoxification. This might be something for your liver, uh, for the kidneys, um, because those are so important for getting rid of toxic metals. And then specific uh, vitamins, minerals, as needed, as indicated, on your mineral analysis or symptoms. We find that some need more products than others, so the program may need adjusting, so keep in touch. Some people just are very sensitive and they can take supplements, say, once a day and they'll get tremendous results. If they take more than that, they feel overloaded. Other people need three times a day, so this is sort of an individual matter and it will change. It's important to understand what we're doing. We're using supplements to bridge over, often, enzy defective enzymatic pathways. Um, there's something called genetic polymorphisms. These are not genetic defects, but they're different expressions of genes that don't work very well. And this is usually caused, or can be caused, certainly by toxic metals or nutrient deficiencies. And by giving higher doses of nutrients, more than the recommended daily allowance, we can bridge over those um, defects, allow your body to function better, and then that allows the body to get rid of the problem and it doesn't need the nutrient after a while. Uh, nutrient programs should be reviewed at least every six months. Don't go over six months. People sometimes call me and they've taken the same vitamins for three years. Well, that is not ideal because your needs will change. 
So it's good to retest. In the beginning, I often recommend it in three months and then longer, sometimes after a while. You can go on a maintenance program, but it needs to be set up as a maintenance program. Remember, the way this program works is to uncover layer by layer of imbalances. So as you go down to the next layer, your needs may change quite a bit. Every effort is made to keep the program small and to keep the cost down. Um, speak, to, speak to me or practitioner about doing that if, if that needs to happen. There are reactions that occur to supplements. Usually they're benign. Some of them, many of them, are healing reactions. That is, the supplements cause changes that can uh, cause you to have um, be tired or anxious or have certain aches and pains and things. We, we can talk about those. Occasionally, a person is sensitive to a product, and I haven't found any products or any brand of products that nobody is sensitive to it. It just is a personal matter, and it can be dealt with by calling the practitioner. Um, so adjusting your supplement program is important, and... The idea is to get in a habit of taking these things. You can carry them around with you in a little uh, baggies or little vitamin vitamin chest um, and just sort of do it. Um, you can At home, you can put them in a little egg crate perhaps for the week, lay them out for the week, and just take them out of there as you need them. You can take a day a week off. Some people like to do that. Some people do not. But if you need a day a week off, that's okay. Okay, another topic that I want to talk about is lifestyle. This is very, very important. It's usually lifestyle problems that get us into health problems in the beginning, although it can be certainly poor food. Sleep and rest are most important. If you want to get well, you need to rest a lot. Just plan on resting. Plan on getting more sleep than usual. Plan on taking naps. Um, at work, take breaks. Go lie down at lunchtime. There are many ways to do it. Most people do not sleep enough. I would say an average of nine hours at least. I remember Dr. Bernard Jensen said, lights out at nine o'clock. So sleep and rest cannot be overemphasized. Most of your healing takes place when you're asleep. If you're running around all the time, you simply will not heal very well. If you find that you can't sleep, then you lie down and rest, nap. Um, it's fine just to rest. I often have to force myself just to stay in bed and rest because that's the overactivity of the sympathetic nervous system. People just want to go and go, and they're just used to that. So you, it takes a little time to get used to sort of the lazy lifestyle, and you'll put up with some guilt that you're taking it easy so much, and... You know, you may have to turn down, you know, invitations to go places and do things. That's perfectly fine. Um, but do it because you want to do it, not because you have to and so forth. Because if, if, you're, if your mind is not in the right place, it will affect your health. As far as exercise is concerned, um, most people, although some people do nothing, which isn't so great. It's nice to walk, maybe 15 minutes, 20 minutes. If you're on a healing program, I suggest very little exercise, actually. Definitely no vigorous exercise. Skip the mountain climbing and the long hikes and the aerobics and jazzercise and all that. Walking, gentle walking with deep breathing. Um, it can be yoga, maybe light weights, lifting weights if you like to do that. Um, or other mild, gentle exercise program is, is fine and plenty. Um, and breathe deeply when you do your exercise and, and stretch and do other things. We're not trying to um, get your heart rate up or get you to start sweating all over the place. It's not about that. Um, exercise pushes the body into sympathetic um, dominance, and that's not helpful for healing. So I would keep the exercise mild. Um, eating habits are very important. We already mentioned them. I'll mention them again. Eat uh, regular, relaxed, sit-down meals. Pr uh, nicely prepared in a quiet surrounding. Eat slowly, chew thoroughly. Avoid restaurants and other places that are noisy and smelly and uh, where people are in a hurry and so forth. Um, 
lifestyle incorporates many things. For example, when you, when you dress, use natural clothing, natural fiber clothing. Uh, a lot of people are wearing tight clothing that cuts off their circulation. They're wearing synthetic clothing that doesn't breathe and that's loaded with chemicals. So certainly the clothing that's next to your body, and preferably all of it, keep it natural and loose-fitting and comfortable clothing always. Um, sunshine is nice. Not too much, but say half an hour a day is very nice to be out in the sun each day that you can for half an hour. Um, if you can't go outside because it's very cold, try to stand in front of a window, and preferably with not too much clothing on, to get some sunshine each day. The sunshine is a nutrient. It's light is a nutrient and contains many excellent things. Surround yourself with books and music and uh, radio and television if you want to have those that are uplifting and inspiring. This is very important. Everything around you should be promoting your healing program. I find that people are all gung-ho to do their healing program, and they take their vitamins, their diet, and they, then they're reading horrible material, or they're paranoid, and they're reading about how, you know, the world's going to come to an end, and asteroids are going to fall on us, and whatever else, or they're watching junk on television that is sort of like poison for the mind. So the books that you read, the music you listen to should be soothing and quiet and beautiful and uplifting, and everything around you, the objects in your home, Everything should promote the healing. What I found is that often healing is simply a matter of doing more things correctly than you do incorrectly. And it takes a conscious effort, certainly at first, for most of us, to literally go through your house, throw things away, um, and so forth. For example, you, uh, it was very helpful for me to simplify my possessions because often we're holding on to all kinds of old things that, have, carry memories of failed relationships and pets that died and r friendships of people who died and all kinds of stuff that actually has very negative connotations. It's very nice to, to clean house, go through your stuff, get rid of a lot of things, give it away, buy new things, um, it, and, and not have a lot of stuff around. Even just having a lot of things, even if they're nice things, uh, they all take energy. Actually, they can all suck your energy little by little in, in very simple ways. Um, even having too many friends, believe it or not, too many phone calls, these things can take up your energy and time, and it's not healthy. You may think this is going overboard, but um, you may be surprised when you sort of clean house. Um, the work that you do makes a big difference. Some people are in very negative work environments, they may not realize it because they may, you may have done this for years, but there can be backbiting, there can be bosses who, who are very sick or very compulsive or uh, domineering. Um, the uh, environment may be very full of chemicals, smells, um, or just the kind of work. I remember hearing someone on the radio, and her job as a biologist was to document the destruction of the environment. And she said that's what she did every day. She went out in her car and she documented the destruction of the environment. And it was a, it was a program, and the person saying, uh, who interviewed her said, gee, you know, it sounds like you should get another job. I mean, who would want to do that every day? And so our work is important. And even if you earn less money, if you're in a happy, uplifting, fun environment doing something, it can be anything. It can be selling flowers. It doesn't have to be a fancy job. Don't, don't get hung up on having the perfect job. But it needs to be uplifting. Uh, relationships. Um, sometimes this is a problem. Now, as we heal, often our perceptions will change dramatically. I mean dramatically as, as we deal with our own stuff. But sometimes there are relationships that are obviously not beneficial. And it's best to distance yourself from, from certain people. So uh, this has to be looked at. It can be roommates. It can be friends. It can be... Marriages, it can be all kinds of things. Uh, relationships should be supportive. Um, and, uh, and this is another area. Um, it's important to take control of your life. Now, 
at, at some spiritual level, we're never quite in control. I believe the Holy Spirit sends us what we need for our life at all times. However, if you're letting other people run your life, that's not good for your health. And it's very tempting to do that because then you think you're a good person because when the church group calls, you just drop what you're doing and you go running off. Or when your friends call and they need help, you just drop your, what you're doing and you go running off. Well, if you keep doing that, you suffer. You, you need to set up a little um, calendar uh, or, or day, day, um, day calendar where you decide, well, this is when I'm going to eat breakfast and this is when I'm going to take my little nap and this is when I'm going to take lunch and then I'm going to go and I'm going to do a few things and I'm going to take a bath and I'm going to do my sauna perhaps and then I'm going to go eat dinner. And you need to stick to that. And when people call up and say, well, you've just got to come over right now and we, we've got this project going and can you please help us, you need to look at your calendar and say, well, let me see, I have a little time here in the afternoon and that's when I can do it. In other words, if you don't set up a schedule, others will do it for you and you will be forever tossed around like the wind. So that's what I mean by taking control. I mean doing a little programming, because if you don't program your life, others will program it for you. I call this enlightened selfishness. And if you think about it, every great leader like Jesus and Buddha and all these people, they all deviated from the crowd. They didn't just go and do what everybody else wanted them to do. They separated themselves from their families even, and from their friends, and they did what they needed to do. And that's enlightened selfishness. That's not, they were not selfish people, but they did this so that they could help others, so that they could be healthy and happy. So that's, that's the idea, is enlightened selfishness. Get away from this idea that if you take care of yourself, you're being selfish. It's not true. Um, you, another thing is to get rid of energy wasting, energy wasters. How's that? There are all kinds of energy wasters out there, and they're subtle. For example, I used to drive around a lot. You know, I'd say, well, gee, I need to go and do this, and so I'd jump in my car. And, you know, I used to live in Phoenix, Arizona, where to jump in your car, you end up driving for a half an hour just to go to the cleaners or something. So there are many little habits that waste our energy. It can be talking on the phone too much. It can be worrying too much about a pet or a or plant outside or... There's all sorts of things that can waste a tremendous amount of time and energy, and it's important to identify these things. So you need to review everything you do, basically. A good way to do that, by the way, is to take up something like meditation, just sitting quietly every day, because often if you do that, it will be brought to your attention that, gee, you know, I'm spending a lot of time uh, shopping for clothing or searching the Internet. You know, some people tell me, gee, well, I'm on the Internet all the time. Well, I say, what are you doing? Well, you know, I'm checking out sports, I go shopping, you know, I'm checking on the war. Whatever is going on, I'm doing it. Well, but that can waste a lot of energy and time. So it's a matter of setting priorities and, and looking out for energy wasters, both physical energy, like running around, mental energy, emotional energy, that kind of thing. It can look very benign, but it can waste energy. Um, okay. So these are, these are some ideas about your activities. Attitudes are most important and a very important part of lifestyle. Very important. Um, I, it's a big area, so I'm just going to run through some basic things. It's, it, it's good to have humor. If you find yourself too serious, you're in trouble. And that means serious about yourself, serious about the world, etc. If you're into negative thinking, that's a problem. You need to get some inspiring books. I recommend A Course in Miracles. Uh, and there are many other things. There's a book called Love Without End um, by Glenda Green. I have a little book called um, The Real Self, which lays out basic spiritual principles. Anytime you get into a negative space, you want to work on that. You know, Pick up a book. Pick up a tape. Because that, those are just bad habits, frankly. Same as with excessive seriousness. You want to learn to forgive everybody, and I mean everybody. You can't make exceptions. You can't say, well, I'll forgive everybody except for that uncle who, you know, molested me when I was three or something like that. No, it's got to be everybody and everything. It's got to be the IRS, the president, the, everybody. And practice forgiveness um, all the time. 
and realize that you are loved. You are loved more than you know, more than you can even possibly imagine. And that has to start out as an intellectual idea and then it can become a feeling because all these things have to be feelings eventually. And you work with these and you work with your mind. You work with it like it's a dog that needs retraining, basically. You know, an animal that needs training. And it's not an easy process at times. It will be stuck in its little patterns. And you just work with it and work with it and work with it. So attitudes and emotions are very, very important. Uh, they really deserve a separate tape here. Um, but I want to go through more things, so I'm going to move on. In your environment, it's very important to stay away from chemicals. When you're healing, we're getting these chemicals and heavy metals out. But a lot of people are just surrounded by them. So you want to go through your house and your personal items. For example, perfumes, toothpaste, cologne, cosmetics, deodorants. Um, there's so many chemicals that we just put on our bodies. Um, most of them need to be thrown away. You can go to the health food store. You can find ones that are better. But read labels carefully because just because it's at a health food store does not mean it's good. Hair dye is very, uh, very toxic. There is natural hair dye. Some people don't like it as much, but it, there, is, there are natural, natural products that you can use or just uh, learn to go without. Um, you know, uh, people sit in hot tubs that are full of chemicals. It's good to filter out chlorine if you're bathing in a lot of chlorine. In some areas of the country, this is the case. Where you live and work, the building materials can be full of um, chemicals. Again, carpeting, especially new carpeting. I don't recommend new carpeting. There is natural carpeting, but it's quite expensive, made out of wool or some other materials. Um, but you can get, these days you can get pretty inexpensive wood flooring um, or uh, tile flooring, and you have to watch out for glues that they use. So if you're remodeling, um, pay attention to this. You can now get paints and caulks that are low in chemicals. There are catalogs. You might look on the Internet. Noise pollution is a big one. Um, some people, you know, you get used to noise, and but it's not good. So you don't want to be around a lot of noise, whether it's machinery, cars, or other things, or even TVs, radios, blaring. Um, learn to control these things. And there are many things that can be done. There are ways to shield things. Air quality is important. Um, in your workplace, there should be fresh air. Uh, the new buildings where they don't open the windows are not really very good. There are little air purifiers that you can wear or that you can have at your desk if you can't control it. But these are things to consider, and it's things to consider when you take a job and when you buy a house, and there are things you can do in your house, uh, many things you can do to improve the air quality. Um, so the environment is a big one, especially if you're chronically ill. You want to look through all these things. Sometimes you can hire a person who will go through your home and, uh, and show you, point things out. There are more subtle things like geopathic stress, and there are people who have little meters, and they can read electromagnetic stress in your house. Uh, leaving computers on, for example, leaving television sets on, this is not a good idea because these things are putting out electromagnetic fields. You certainly don't want them near where you sleep because that's the most important because you're in the same place for eight hours. And there are people who can douse for uh, geopathic stress. This can be helpful for some people. Okay, another topic is detoxification. And we're kind of getting to the end of the tape, so I need to run through this even faster. But there are some simple procedures. I highly recommend sauna therapy, especially with the electric light sauna. This is an infrared type of sauna that uses infrared lamps. You can use a commercial far infrared sauna or a conventional sauna if those are the only ones available. But an electric light sauna can be constructed very easily. And I have information about that plans. Skin brushing is excellent. When you shower, use a skin brush rather than a lot of soap. Most soaps have chemicals in them. Colonic irrigation and enemas are very helpful for many people, especially when beginning a program if, you're, if your digestion is poor. You may be surprised what comes out of you. And there, then there are procedures like the liver flush. And we have information about all these procedures um, because detoxification procedures are very necessary today. Um, finally, other procedures, especially chiropractic, I would say, but also foot reflexology, massage, body work, and others 
may be very helpful.